Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Molly Martin and I'm the director of New America Indianapolis. And welcome to today's episode of Inside Out where we take stories of Hoosier innovators and use them to inspire action across Indiana and across the country. Today we'll be talking about youth-led policy in the heartland and I'm really excited to be joined today by our partners at Voices Corp and by two youth policy fellows. I'll introduce those in just a moment. Uh, New America is a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank based in Washington, DC, but I make my home here in Indianapolis. And I'm so honored and glad to be able to bring you exceptional stories from here in the middle of the country. So today my partners in sharing those stories include Kia Wright, who is the founder and executive director of Voices Corp. And she'll tell us a little bit more about Voices in a moment. Lauren Hall, who's on the leadership team at Voices and also is doing some work with New America Indianapolis this year. And our guests of honor, our youth policy fellows, Rachel Lobby and Tiffany Young, who are going to share a little bit of their experience as youth advocates, participants in the Voices Youth Policy Fellowship and their insights for those of you out there looking to build a program like this or become advocates yourselves. We believe in the power of youth-led policy, and we believe that policy should be drawn with the community, not just in mind, but by your side and as integral parts to that design. To kick us off today, I'd like to hear from Kia Wright about our partners, about Voices. And so Kia, I'm going to come to you first. I'd love to hear more about who you are, what Voices is, and kind of why we're having this conversation about what we call hashtag Youth America, if you're participating with us online. Kia, take it away. First, thank you, Molly, for allowing us this opportunity. I'm really excited uh, for everyone to hear from our youth fellows. Um, my name is Kia Wright. I started Voices in 2010. My background was in juvenile probation, and it really grew out of frustration. I was a school-based officer here on the east side of Indianapolis, so all youth that were either suspended or expelled came to our location. Um, got a lot of calls from in the classroom about fighting, cussing, gang activities, um, a lot of crime that was happening in the streets of our city. Um, it was really trying to figure out a way to get to the root causes of what was going on with the kids. It started out as an after school art program. At the time, all of my friends were artists and I found art to be incredibly healing and therapeutic and that equalizer to kind of get to truth. Through the kids' artwork, through their poetry, through their music, we found so many underlying issues um, and a lot of underlying trauma that they were experiencing. And we wanted to create programming that centered their experiences and began to give them advocacy over the care and treatment that they were receiving. And so that's really the crux of Voices is really getting to the root cause of what's happening in our cities and our schools and giving kids the tools to advocate for change and be able to center their experiences. Excellent. That's so interesting. I hope if you have questions out there in the audience about voices that you'll hop into the chat and I hope you'll continue the conversation while we chat online here. So Kia, based on what you just said, it sounds like uh, beyond finding kind of a therapeutic restorative moment for youth here in Indianapolis and in Indiana, you're really interested in making sure youth understand their power. Is that fair? Absolutely. Um, I think every, um, a lot of places have been focused on trauma-informed care, and that is basically recognizing that a harm or injury had happened to a person and that there needed to be some kind of therapeutic resolve from that. Our agency moved to healing-centered engagement, and that's really getting to the root of the problem, healing as a collective, and making sure that they know that they have power and advocacy over the change, and making sure that that power is rooted in their identity individually of who they are. Fantastic. Well, I know we're lucky enough to have two of your youth partners here with us today. And so I'm going to pivot to you, Rachel and Tiffany, to share a little bit about what brought you to Voices and the sort of work that you do there. Uh, you know, I'm going to just kind of pick it out of the air. Tiffany, I'm going to start with you. Okay, nice to meet everyone. My name is Tiffany. I am a high school senior and I decided to join Voice because I wanted to make a change. And at least among the people I knew, a lot of people were relatively apathetic. They believed that um, the government wouldn't do anything, that they couldn't do a lot. And so I wanted to um, be able to help the community in some way. And so I ended up uh, joining this. And through this, I've been able, uh, I've ended up joining YES. And through YES, I ended up uh, being able to uh, affect change in a positive way to help my community. 
That's great. Rachel, how about you? I saw some nodding. I learned about voices when an associate of mine explained the program to me and offered for me to become a YES fellow. And ever since seventh grade, human trafficking is something I've always cared about. I started off with written advocacy, sending letters to fashion brands, questioning them about labor standards. And so when I heard about voices and the program they offer, I thought I could actually create policies and inform youth across Indiana. So I decided to enter and I was admitted and I've been able to join a labor trafficking subcommittee and speak to hundreds of representatives to broaden my message and to get awareness out there. Great. And Rachel, you'll, you're also a high school senior? Yes. Fantastic. That's amazing. So you both have been in this advocacy life for a minute and, and found this great outlet through YES. So you've both mentioned YES. And Lauren, I'd like to come to you to tell us a little bit more about the YES Fellowship at Voices, how it works, and, and who participates. Yes, uh, it's a privilege to do it um, and full kudos to our youth fellows, to Kia's leadership um, on a systems level. Uh, it has been uh, truly a highlight of my career so far. Um, I started as an in-classroom educator, similar to Kia, I felt that um, systems were not set up well for students to thrive holistically. Um, felt that, to your point, Molly, uh, power. Um, there were so many things that, um, and so much much time being invested, figuring out structures to limit youth power. Um, and I love what I love about our work at Voices. Yes, um, you know, empowering youth to have a critical role in policymaking is that we are constantly asking ourselves, how do we create the structures for youth to manifest and expand their power? And so um, really it comes down to uh, taking them through what it means to go through personal change, do some of that healing, uh, you know, uh, analyze and understand how their personal story then adds to collective change and then systemic change. Fantastic. I, you know, I do a lot of these events. I'm great, uh, lucky enough to do this with Indianapolis frequently. This is the most concise group I have ever worked with. It's amazing. We're going to sail through this and, and cover a lot of ground. So I really appreciate it. Uh, so when we talk about this going through healing while you're also making change for your community, Rachel, could you reflect a little bit on what it was like to kind of bring a lot of passion and maybe a little bit of sadness and anger and remain productive, remain really focused on policy change. That seems like it would be a hard balance. Well, at the beginning of Yes Fellows, we focused a lot on storytelling and explaining our perspectives on the systems we've been in. So I was in the group of educational and economic inequity. So all of our proposals would center around that one topic. And so we had homeless people in our group, people who were involved in the foster care system, people who dealt with financial issues. And so we wanted to think about those stories, their tales, and make change. So for example, one of the proposals we had was a personal financial responsibility class that would be required in Indiana, because we didn't want children to have to go through the same issues they had seen their parents go through, or if they didn't even have parents, some of the issues they had to go through by themselves. So we just wanted to be productive and make sure no other kids had to go through what they had to go through. And my topic labor trafficking was very different than the other topics but we were able to provide two main proposals and then other sub proposals so we were able to mesh all of our passions into one major proposal which was the personal financial responsibility class so we just all had to work together and this was my first time actually working with a team to accomplish something usually i had just an advocacy by myself but i learned that working with a team really is helpful because you're going to notice things that you had never even thought about. They're going to give you ideas. They're going to give you different perspectives. And that's really important when you are on your journey to becoming an advocate. That's a great point. And certainly having lots of different lived experiences around the table seems to really matter to get to a, a clear proposal. So tell us a little bit more, Rachel. It sounds to me, and in my observation, because I've gotten to, to see a couple sessions of the policy fellows, you come together around certain affinity groups, and, and you've explained a little bit more about yours, you discuss potential ideas, you share personal stories, center on an idea, then what do you do? Once you came up with this proposal for the financial literacy class, what was next? After we came up with our proposal, we did additional research just to make sure to truly understand the issue and make sure our proposal would have the impact we want it to. And we decided to start on our presentation because we would be presenting to hundreds of policymakers across Indiana. So we wanted to be striking. So we started off with personal stories. 
personal stories about um, some of the issues people in our groups had faced. For example, the person in the foster care system, they talked about their experience and all of their debt. They had numbers of their debt. So that was really important to actually make an impact and to make it memorable. So that's what we started off with, but we just focused on the flow of the presentation, statistics, personal stories, other facts, just so we could use pathos, logos, and ethos all together. Really good, really insightful. Now, Tiffany, we've talked a lot already about the importance of personal storytelling when you're making a compelling, compelling policy case. And both you and Rachel were kind enough to share your own stories at the New America Indianapolis blog and, and to help motivate change. If you'd like to, if you're willing to, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your personal story and how it's motivated your own advocacy, and also a little bit about how you worked up the courage to, to share a personal story in a public setting. Okay. Um, yeah, growing up, I had dealt with um, mental illness uh, for a long time. I did not realize that it was mental illness. My parents, the people around me, they told me that, oh, that this is not a problem, that you are simply being a teenager or a child. You need to grow up. You need to get grit and things like that. And so because of these beliefs, because of stigma that I'd encountered from other people of concerning mental health and mental illness, I was not able to get treatment for a very long time. And it wasn't until I got treatment that it became very, very clear to me how important um, the community and the role they, how important the community and family played in essentially uh, delaying my treatment and making it much more difficult uh, for me to get the help that I needed. And so I ended up meeting other people who had similar experiences, um, who were told by others that, oh, you don't have mental illness or that this is not important that you need to focus on school or something. And so this made me very upset. I hated how it was because of cultural stigma, um, how a lot of misconceptions about mental health uh, permeated the community and made people say things that um, were insensitive, offensive, and ultimately sometimes uh, led to deeply harmful effects on other people. And so I kind of channeled this anger, um, this frustration at this system um, into helping others. So I worked with my team at YES. Um, we shared stories about what happened to us, what uh, other people had told, what other people had told us and how treatment had ultimately helped us. And it was through this vulnerability with each other that we were able to create a very strong group with really um, powerful bonds. And through that, we were able to create a proposal concerning mental health and illness education and treatment in Indiana schools. And we, we used this proposal and spoke to hundreds of legislators at a summit. Later on, we worked with Rep Vanessa Summers to create this bill. Uh, to turn this proposal into a bill. And then we submit this to the Indiana Legislative Assembly. And currently I'm working with my amazing team to advocate for a very specific uh, House bill, uh, House Bill 1444, which uh, proposes having mental health professionals in Indiana. Congratulations, that's incredibly important. Uh, and I would encourage everyone, by the way, who is watching today to check out newamerica.org slash Indianapolis where you can find work by Rachel and by Tiffany and hear a little bit more about their stories and their ideas. So Kia, as you're listening to two of your youth partners here talk about being so vulnerable and the importance of vulnerability, I'd love to hear from you as a practitioner and a leader uh, what could we, as kind of working mid-career folks, learn about the power of vulnerability in social change uh, from our guests, from voices, from folks that you see? One, and I think both of the young ladies on here spoke to it, it, it takes a lot of courage to share and to get this deep with folks that don't know you. And Rachel and Tiffany did an amazing job, you know, off the bat with that. You know, Lauren and I were very intentional when we were creating this YES program and that we wanted it to be kids that were impacted by some level of the system, education, mental health, foster care, juvenile delinquency, because we find ourselves in these spaces where it's all adults, right? And we're talking about what's best for kids. We're talking about, you know, things that they need to be doing, but we're not taking the time to recognize that they are the experts. They are literally living in these conditions 
you know, going through these changes every single day. But as adults, we have these blinders on sometimes that we know best simply because we're over the age of 21. And that doesn't always qualify us to tell kids how to know what they need to do. And part of what, you know, we really try to do is build up, you know, their confidence and affirm who they are. Part of healing student engagement is affirming the uniqueness in all of our young people, affirming all of the talents and treasures that they have and making sure that they know that they are not the worst experience or thing that they did, right? And so that's really what this program was about is teaching them how to voice that and how to, you know, find courage in themselves and how that is going to help other people. You know, for me, that's really what equity looks like. And that's really what shifting the power when we're talking about systemic change looks like. Let's put that power back into the communities and to the young people that it's impacting. And so I was very proud of Tiffany and Rachel for having the courage to stand up tell their story um, and be able to, like you, you know, alluded to Molly, follow through with that. I've told you my story, now what are you gonna do about it? You know, we're not just gonna leave them hanging, right? And so I think that's what we want everyone that is in these youth serving roles to understand that it's not just what this kid did. It's not just what happened to this child. You have to look at the holistic of this situation of the, the person and look at the systems that have been created that allow these things to continue to happen. And let's take our advice from the people that is being impacted the most. That's a great point. Uh, yeah, don't do it uh, for me without me, right? You know, a pretty important adage in life. One question that I've gotten, Kia, and question that I've had personally, when thinking about building a youth-oriented and youth-led policy program is, for the safety of the youth involved. We've talked a little bit about the ways that you provide healing orientation and safety through voices. Are there other safety concerns that people out there considering building a program should have in mind? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I think is always critical when we allow our youth into these adult spaces is that training or conversation beforehand. Um, they have to know, you know what triggers are. You know what I mean? What can you ask a youth? Make sure that you are asking permission, you know, before you touch on certain subjects and being aware that there are so many environmental and so many emotional triggers that, you know, can happen. Um, also, you know, us understanding that once we get to this level of relationship building with, you know, our young people, things are going to come out. And so there has to be clear boundaries on what our expectations are as youth providers, what we have to, you know, say what we have to do to protect them, but also creating that safe space. Um, we can't just put, you know, Lauren can talk a little bit more about it. We are very selective of the adults that we allow to interact with our young people for that reason. You know, we just, there's a tendency, well, what happened? Well, what happened? What happened? And, you know, sometimes that doesn't get to the point of how can I help this? How can I make that better? Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And I think as a person with a little bit of background in journalism, you do have to be cautious, right? When you're getting to the bottom of something that you aren't uh, causing further harm. And, and you know, Lauren Kia mentioned that you might have some reflection on that and, and how you might counsel folks on how to make sure the right adults are in the room to receive some of this policy feedback. And I'd love to hear more about how you make sure it's the right set of adults. Sure. And I don't know that. Um... I think all humans are in flux. And so I do think that um, uh, any adult at a point in their journey can be ready to engage with youth. I think it is, you know, as Kia is mentioning about an orientation that the adults go into uh, the room with, um, because we do, I mean, we have some adults who are deeply well-intentioned, um, whether they be at the state house or in the classroom or in a youth serving um, organization who are deeply well intentioned and do not have the orientation of, of healing, right? So again, I, we're bringing it up a lot. I wanna give huge kudos and, and directly name that we're talking about healing centered engagement. Um, it's a theory, it's a model, it's an approach that Dr. Sean Jenright uh, created and it has been a, a real uh, treat to follow him throughout his career um, as uh, as a scholar and as a practitioner. You know, he he he's kind of come up with uh, a lot of educators in in my social circles who see that we have to heal kids. Um, we have to make sure that adults are are doing their own healing. Because um, to Kia's point, the kids have triggers, so do adults, um, and we've seen that happen. Um, and so I I think it's really critical um, to uh, yes 
choose adults who are at the right place in their own development and their own processing, who are genuinely there because they want to contribute to creating structures that manifest and expand youth power. And that means that they are not over focused on the trauma, but they are actually focused on the assets of youth. Um, and that's a key, uh, key element of healing centered engagement is that, yes, we do, we have to acknowledge the trauma that individuals have experienced. We also have to expand our understanding and realize that our society is not well. It is not, you know, Tiffany's individual struggle or Rachel's individual struggle or mine or Kia's or anyone's, right? It is actually a collective issue if all of us are not well. And so I think um, that collective orientation is also really critical to the way in which we bring people in to talk with our youth and the community we create with our youth. That's great. And, and you talk about community a lot. And, and all of you have talked about your teams and how you haven't done any of this alone. And, and Rachel, I'd like to come back to you. You've talked a little bit about the lived experiences that some of your teammates have had uh, who are helping you uh, craft this policy. Tell us a little bit more about, if I'm in the room, what are the ages of, of my teammates? What are the backgrounds of my teammates? Does everybody live in Indianapolis? Uh, you mentioned some folks are currently experiencing homelessness. A little more uh, technicolor around who's in the, in the room with you. Well, in Yes Fellow, something they really value is diversity. So the age range is huge. I'm a high school senior, but ninth grade, and there are people in college. They heavily value diversity, and you can also see that in location. It's from all around Indiana, so it's not just Indy. They make sure to include people of all different backgrounds, but particularly people who have been involved in systems and who have stories that can help improve those systems. You know, Rachel, that's interesting to me. When I was able to sit in with one of the yes meetings, something I noticed is like you said, not everyone was located here in Indianapolis. And for those watching who might not be from Indiana, there are some pretty big leaps between say Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, and other metro areas. Um, you go from a very large place to a very small one pretty quickly in Indiana. Um, so Rachel and Tiffany, and Tiffany, I'll start with you and then come back to Rachel. Do you have any reflections from your peers about how much harder it is or easier it is, um, or maybe it's the same, to get help or find connection for youth in smaller places in Indiana? Do you have some small town teammates who have had some stories that you wanna make sure we hear? Yeah, I would say that for smaller towns, um, some people on my team, they've had great experiences and some others had very negative experiences. It really depended on the person and their experience. For example, some schools that were smaller, they were able to allocate some of their resources to something that they knew were problems. For example, some of them were able to have access to funding and have like access to school personnel that could help them on their mental health journey. While other students, they did not have that. And some even encountered teachers who said things like, oh, you don't have depression because teenagers can't have depression. And so depending on the different areas, um, some had very positive experiences that were very welcoming and very community-based and focused. And and others were um, full of misconceptions. Sure. Rachel, other reflections from you? Well, in my group, most people were from very metropolitan areas like Indy. So the biggest problem for them wasn't necessarily the resources, but actually getting them and actually knowing about them. So not just whether it was a small town or a large town. That's a good point. I think access, whether it's transportation or awareness, or an adult who could help you navigate it when you need to, uh, that's, a, that's a real problem, whether you're in a small place or a large place. I also heard in, in observing some of the yes conversations that if you're in a smaller community, and that community could be a neighborhood in a large metro, or it could just be a small town, uh, it can be hard when everyone knows what's going on with you and everyone has an opinion about what's going on with you. And so uh, one of the things I have to imagine would be good about having the yes community is coming to a place um, where folks are really committed to your healing and, and your privacy. On the question of, of commitment to healing, Kia, what do you think people typically misunderstand about trauma-informed and healing-centered education and youth advocacy? Um, I don't know if it's a misunderstanding. I think it's just different approaches 
um, you know, with trauma informed, it's very focused on the harm and the injury, and it's almost a deficit based. And the biggest difference, you know, with healing centered is that it's just more asset driven, right? Um, here locally in Indianapolis, <clears throat> a lot of our students um, are from Department of Child Services or Juvenile Probation. We have a lot of gun violence here in um, the city. We have a lot of those kids involved with gun violence and addiction and things like that. And there's a tendency to solely focus on them carrying a gun or <clears throat> lashing out in some form, right? There isn't a tendency to say that this kid is a leader. This kid could be a mentor for younger kids in the neighborhood to prevent the gun violence, to prevent you know, these things from occurring. And so I think if there is a misconception, it is <clears throat> that they aren't viewed as valuable if that makes sense. You know what I mean? It's more of, this is what happened. Let's push them through probation. Let's push them through the courts or whatever system that they're connected to. But I don't think there's a tendency to say, how do we teach these skills that they're getting on the streets anyway and make those skills transferable to be become more productive? You know, everyone jokes, there's a lesson that we do here with our day reporting kids. Um, we'll get kids in for dealing drugs and things like that. I'm like, you're a great salesman. You have great math skills. You have great person, people skills, you know? And so I think it's just really shifting the view of how we look at these kids. And I think that's what healing centered engagement gives us. It gives us a fresh eye to see people and to see what their skills are, not to make excuses for their behavior, but how do we cultivate the things that they're naturally good at and turn that into things where they can show up differently in the world. I love that margin, you know, between kind of traits and behavior, because it seems to me that, yeah, whether it's entrepreneurialism or sales skills or being incredibly networked or organized or able to stay busy, you learn a lot when you're trying to survive. And I know a lot of systems involved youth feel the pressure of, of trying to survive as, as well as thrive. So Rachel, when, when you think back to the first time you were going to advocate face-to-face, with a lawmaker or someone who has kind of a traditional sense of power. Were you scared? <laughs> Were you nervous? I was very nervous yeah. because I would consider myself a shy individual, but I learned that when I speak about something I care about, I'm not necessarily shy. What advice would you give to someone who's watching right now, who's maybe 15, who is excited or worried about an issue, but the idea of going to the state house just rattles them? What would you say? Ultimately, don't make it about yourself, even if you are nervous, because it's about the victims, everyone who's been a victim, everyone who's had to struggle. So don't focus on your own worries. Focus on the change you can make and the people you can affect positively. Oof, Rachel, I needed that today anyway. So thank you. That's, that's really insightful. Uh, Tiffany, a, a related question. When I walk into a state house or the US Capitol or any sort of traditional place of power, it's intimidating, even though I've spent 43 years wandering in and out of places. So talk to me about the importance of walking into spaces. Do you have any reflections on, on what it's like for a young person to walk into these kind of marble halls, these hard to navigate places? Were you at ease? Did you need advice? Would you have advice for folks who, who manage public spaces about how to make it more accessible? Yeah, walking into any of those grand spaces, it's extremely overwhelming, especially if it's the first time, because usually everywhere it's really normal looking and then suddenly you go into this almost temple like a grandiosity. Um, I would say in general, don't be scared. The people there, they're all wearing suits. They all look really serious. They, they're not that intimidating. Like they're people too. And they're in this position because they do care and they do want to make change. So don't be as scared. Um, figure out what works for you and how like you calm down, depending on the person. It can be really different. I know some people, they like to practice their whole pitch like 30 minutes before. Other people, they like to play games. Some people go for a run beforehand if they can. So try to find what really works for you because that's different for everyone. Um, don't be intimidated by the people you're talking with and understand that they really do care and they're willing to listen. I mean, after all, they did have an appointment with you. So they are taking the time out of their day to listen to what you want to say. 
That's a great orientation. You know, Lauren, I, I know you well enough to know that you've been in and out of a lot of advocacy spaces and, and formal and informal spaces alike. Lauren, what drives you crazy when you walk into these hyper formal spaces about ways they are and aren't accessible or welcoming? Um, I think it's interesting because, yeah, referencing what Rachel and Tiffany said about um, how one equips themselves to enter those spaces, I think uh, particularly with the insurrection on the Capitol, you know, I think I'm in a new understanding of what those spaces mean and what they look like. I think we both need to hold on to the fact that it is special to serve community and your people. It is special and it is, I, I think, you know, Tiffany used the term temple. Um, I, without going, you know, too much into the religio religio religiosity of, of things, I do think it's um, very sacred and we should continue to honor the fact that people are serving and um, that is meaningful. And I think we should also um, acknowledge that spaces um, should be human, uh, should be accessible. Um, and I really think that's about um, how we help individuals uh, take themselves seriously. I mean, I, to your point, Molly, I have been in different advocacy spaces. I have been woefully underprepared uh, to enter most of them. And I think it's just been um, a real pleasure to be able to uh, transfer some of that learning onto uh, young people and hear their wisdom and insights as well. Um, because I think, you know, it's, it, it's often that we are either taking ourselves too seriously or not seriously enough. And I think the more that we um, build ourselves in communities of advocacy, as we have been so intentional about doing within Youth Fellows, I think the better able we are to be relaxed, be the right level of seriousness, and um, step into those spaces with our full critical hope and humanity. And just to add on that, Molly, if it's okay, real quick. One thing that I think Lauren and I were very intentional about specifically with our young ladies of color was to take up space, right? You know, there's a lot of tables that we are sitting at where we are overtalked um, and that messes, you know, with your mind and your confidence and things like that. And so again, why we are so proud of Tiffany and Rachel is taking up that space because they are the experts and making sure that we teach that really early on. I love that, taking up space and knowing your, your value and your expertise. Kia, I want to stay with that with you for a minute. Are there ways you think women, especially, let's just stay with women, can support each other around a table at a moment like that? Absolutely. Um, I think you all have been in meetings with me before. Um, but for me, that taking up space means a lot of different things. It's one, bringing your ideas and your fullness to those spaces, right? And making sure that you are not overlooked. In terms of women supporting each other, that's making sure that you're bringing other women to those tables with you. You are encouraging, you are sharing resources, you are sharing wealth. Um, there's, we have a lot of battles to fight outside of just being women. Um, I'm a big champion of us sticking together and making sure that we're supporting and encouraging, a, <clears throat> encouraging each other. And all the young ladies that we work with in the program, we make sure that that is forefront um, in their minds, that they are powerful, that they are needed, and that they are necessary. Um, and so just trying to build that um, and making sure that they spread that as well, um, that they're always bringing another woman with them. I love that advice. One thing that I, I have found interesting in my career, I don't know if it's been challenging because just to be candid, I have a lot on my side. I recognize the, the power of kind of white privilege or parents who went to college, um, other things, you know, blonde hair, you know, different spaces are different ways, but the way you present yourself in certain formal spaces is a challenge for all kinds of people. Women, uh, people with different gender identities, people's sexuality, I'm sure for lots of men, certainly people of different race and ethnicity. Sometimes those questions are about names or hair or earrings or clothing. How much, and I wanna hear from everybody, I'm gonna start with Rachel. How much do you think people should adapt to the spaces they're going to versus pushing the spaces to change. And, you know, Rachel, in terms of going in and, and bringing your full self. If you're presenting yourself in a new space, you need to be subtle if you do want to change the aura of the space. But if you don't have much power within the space, you should probably conform at least a little bit because 
those are probably people who aren't used to interacting or working with people like you. So you need to be cautious of that because there is a cultural difference. That's really interesting. So that's that's a pretty pragmatic take um, and certainly someone who has the maturity to see how things have gone. Tiffany, what would you say? Again, I would say it kind of depends on the person. If you can try to figure out like this company, this person who you're meeting with, figure out what they're like if you can. And if you know what this person is kind of like, then perhaps try to uh, basically uh, alter your appearance to what would ideally fit them if they are the ones that are ultimately um, in the position of power. Um, if you can't do that, which I think is more realistic, honestly, um, try to uh, balance yourself. So don't like so for example don't walk in wearing um a rainbow suit or something at a funeral try to be appropriate um based on the culture of the, this uh occasion and but also try to like keep parts of yourself as well um don't just erase your whole identity like keep parts of yourself that you think are really important and that you value because you should never sacrifice that sort of thing for someone else so much more pragmatism and wisdom. Kia, I'd love to hear what you think. So this was a lesson that I got right after undergrad. Um, I was living in Terre Haute, Indiana, attending Indiana State University, working on my master's, and I was inter uh, interning with the juvenile probation department. I had this massive fro that was so cute. I had grown this fro out probably for about eight years, right? Couldn't tell me anything with this afro. And so they were all used to me. After I graduated, um, they offered for me to interview. So I go in for my interview um, and my hair was straightened. And the lady interviewing me was a white woman. She was like, what happened to your Afro? And I told her that I was taught that in corporate America, that that type of hairstyle was not acceptable. And I straightened my hair so that I would fit into the culture more. And she was like, have you lost your mind? We loved you for you, you know what I mean? We didn't care about your hair. You know, that was one of the things that we loved most about you because it was just part of who you were. And I carried that for a long time. And it really taught me that, yes, there is some form of, you know, conformity when you're going into certain spaces, but at the end of the day, you know, who I am is going to shine through that. You know, I'm not gonna be, I cannot worry about being judged about clothing and things like that, that it's my, intellect, my ability, um, that is what's going to stand out. Even now when I go into spaces, I have dreadlocks, you know, um, a black woman with dreadlocks and I do get those looks <clears throat> and I had to really develop that self-confidence like, this is it, this is what you get. <laughs> we, like, we like what we get. Lauren, how about you? Yeah, no, I just, um, it's funny. So uh, we're, we're not going to share all the things that happen in our uh, also sacred uh, youth fellows meetings, but we actually had uh, it's sort of internal disagreement about this. I don't know if you guys remember this, but uh, we, we had some folks that um, were uh, very adamant that we needed to disrupt uh, stereotypes and sort of systems of expectation by wearing, um, you know, things that self-expressed, um, but things that were maybe not traditionally seen as valuable, worthy, knowledgeable, et cetera, in that space. And I think, you know, um, as an educator and as a person who is, you know, amidst all of my uh, becoming and developing as a leader um, and a collective leader, uh, I think, you know, creating reflective processes for folks uh, is really the goal of our work because um, as much as it's fantastic um, when we can call each other up or text each other, um, you don't always have um, someone to rely on in that exact moment. So creating the reflective processes of why am I making this decision? How am I going to choose to lean into the decision once I make it, um, et cetera, have been really powerful. And I'll just name the, because I think this might be helpful for folks who are thinking about doing this type of program um, across the country. Uh, you know, we, we often, I, I'll bring up the scale of like, where, how are you feeling about making change today? Are you like, we need to burn it all down and everything is over and I, it's just, it, it needs to be burned down or are you status quo? I think everything's great, right? 
most of the time, we're all somewhere in the middle, um, but being reflective about where we are and asking ourselves, why is that? Is it because I need to do some of my own healing? Um, you know, do I want to burn everything down because I don't have enough supports in that moment, or I don't have community to advocate for this issue, or I feel isolated in a certain community to be my full self? Um, do I feel status quo because everything's working for me? And how do I interrogate that? What privileges might I have in those spaces that is allowing me to feel like the way things are is good enough? Um, so creating that reflective process, I think, is a real goal because over time that allows us as individuals in a collective to interrogate ideas and move forward um, with intentionality and um, as a full group. That's really good insight. You know, all of you are making me think a little bit about coming into spaces where you may have power or maybe new. And and I, my adage is always easy for me to say, you know, it's easy for me to say that I would go in and be my full authentic self and be disruptive, knowing that it's always been pretty safe for me to do so. And so to the extent that those of us who can make those spaces safe or different, uh, those of you out in the audience who have that power, I hope we can think about that so that those reflective processes continue to matter, but so that folks um, don't ever doubt that what they are and how they are is, is authentically the way they can present. So here in the last 15 minutes or so of our conversation, you know, I want to take advantage of the fact that we have a bit of a so-called captive audience watching, folks who are interested in policy and interested in change. That's why they're listening today. And so I'm going to ask all of you to kind of think of, of having a magic wand and making that one big policy change that you think really will change outcomes for young people in Indiana. What is your, your queen for a day, your king for a day? You get to wave your wand and X, Y, Z. Law has changed, rule has changed, practice has changed. Um, I'm gonna give you a minute to reflect on it, how you would use your, your magical powers. And I hope folks in the audience are thinking about it as well and feel free to share those in the chat. Okay, Kia made the cardinal error of looking me in the eye, so she has to go first. Kia. <laughs> That's a hard one. That is a really hard one. Um, if I think close about where it starts, um, for a lot of the students that we're working with, it's poverty. And I don't know what that sweeping thing would be, but it's definitely to address the lack of education and employment opportunities in our neighborhoods um, and making sure that they all have equal access to get them out of survival into thriving. Nothing we do, nothing we say is gonna land and stick until folks can have safe housing, can eat um, and feel safe. Absolutely. Tiffany, how about you? There are two things that come to mind. The first is to have an educational campaign concerning mental health and illness um, that is targeted towards everyone, not just schools, but also the community. Because a lot of the times um, treatment can be stalled. Um, it could be started by the school and then it can be stalled by an immigrant community, by a family. And so I would like an educational campaign that's targeted towards everyone um, to understand these things. Um, and I guess a second option would be um, having everyone to have somehow the ability to be able to afford to access to have the time, the transportation to get the mental health they need. Great, great. And actually, stay stay with me, Rachel and Lauren, hang in. Tiffany, there's actually a question in the chat that relates to that. So, so I want to stick with you here about mental health. We actually have um, a pediatrician on listening and kind of curious about what you would have wished your doctor or caregiver had done differently when you were younger and, and what you might advise this pediatrician to be on the lookout for or think about doing for, for their young patients. Um, yeah, sure. For me personally, I did not get a mental health therapist until uh, 10th grade, and it was after a, um, let's just say, traumatic incident for me and my family. Before that, um, I didn't really talk about, I didn't really like talk to any professionals about this sort of thing, because first of all, I just didn't have a lot of contact with these people, so I didn't feel comfortable talking about this sort of thing. 
I think a lot of people have a similar thing. Like they're basically strangers a lot of the time. You see them a few times a year. Do you really want to talk about something as personal as your mental health? Um, in my case, personally, I did not really trust my uh, pediatri my pediatrician. I still don't really trust her, to be honest. Um, and it was largely because she didn't really have um, and she didn't really, she basically espoused several misconceptions about mental illness and mental health and largely took the um, beliefs of the people around me over what I said I experienced. So I guess I would recommend really listening to the patient, the person that is the the person that is the one with like the illness with like the health issue listen to them first and then take in other people's input like the parent the community but do that second listen to the person first thank you tiffany that's so helpful uh rachel kind of coming back to the original premise about that that magic wand what big change would you like to make well although i am passionate about human trafficking i think i would choose something else that could lead to other changes so I'm in between three right now. One would be tighter gun control because I think gun violence in this country is sickening and it happens every day. And there are children who are victims and sometimes it feels like we value the weapon more than people's lives. And another thing I would choose is prison reform because there are many people who go in and out but then they don't have the opportunities to advance themselves educationally or economically. So I think that's really important and also mental health in schools, because I see in my own community, children who are depressed or suicidal, some of them have anxiety, but no one believes them or their parents refuse to accept it. So just having someone that they can talk to and that they're comfortable with at school, I think that's really important. Thank you so much. And, and actually, Rachel, I wanna stay with you for a minute. Um, again, something that is coming through the chat, that's more a global question about uh, your teammates and, and how they engage, but you mentioned you're speaking really vulnerably and, and openly about some things that are often hard to talk about. And stereotypically, sometimes those things are especially hard for young boys to talk about. And so when you think about women in policy leadership um, in your own program or just in your experience, as a, as a peer of some of these young men, what's a good way to make sure that they feel safe to be vulnerable and, and engage in a process like this? One way is opening up first because what I learned in Yes Fellows was when one person started talking about their personal experiences, other people felt more welcome to talk about their own. And so we just had lots of stories being shared, especially the first few Yes Fellows sessions. So that's the best way. Yeah, and, and kind of eyeballing it, Rachel, as a peer, are there, are there an equal number of young men and young women in the Yes Fellows program? Is it tilted one way or the other? Um, I think it's pretty equal. Okay, you're getting some nods from Kia and Lauren. Okay, thank you, that's really helpful. Uh, Lauren, coming back to you and circling back to the magic wand, what are you going to, to use your power for? Well, I am taking notes as an educator and I'm like, I will give them statistics. So Rachel, you never have to like wait for me and Kia to nod. Um, just in terms of statistics of our group, um, we have 14 to 23 year olds had every age in that spectrum. Um, there was a density of the age group you see here, Tiffany and Rachel, um, and they are from 14 different counties across the state of Indiana, um, spanning the entire state. They, uh, their average systems involvement, so Medicare, Medicaid, DCS, juvenile justice, all the things Kia shared, um, their average systems engagement was 3.7. Um, so to Rachel's point, uh, when you create a space where that experience is not tokenized, um, it is that much easier and quicker to uh, create collective healing. Um, and then, yeah, we're about 50 50, um, uh, you know, those who identify as male and female. And we also have a youth fellow who is gender non conforming. So um, we also, uh, you know, I think we're very intentional about uh, celebrating that and, and naming that and um, talking about it. And I think, you know, Kia and I talked about, I mean, we, you know, you can try and you can hope, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's the degree to which the youth lean in, the, the degree to which they support one another. And, you know, to your question, Molly, about how do you get young men to feel safe and seen? I mean, some of the young men that we had on there who just like, you know, I, I had multiple of them tell me like, this is the first time where I've actually been able to talk about this sort of thing or, you know, process my trauma and not feel like it takes away something of my identity that I really value. Um, so kudos to our young ladies here for making that um, cool and meaningful and all of that. 
Um, but my, my answer would be uh, similar to Kia, actually. I think poverty is so often at the root of all of these issues, and it is the core reason that I got into this work in the first place. Um, uh, yeah, and um, I think in part uh, the university universal basic income. I think we can have a lot of conversation about the what's the why's the house, um, what sort of metrics you put on it, but I think that would be really helpful because Tiki is uh, bringing in, um, you know, the day reporting work we do with young men who have been on probation or been expelled or suspended, um, essentially just told that they don't belong in uh, the productive part of our society. Um, so often they are seen as making poor choices because they are selfish, because they are actively trying to cause harm, and because they are, you know, unchangeable and they're just bad kids. And, you know, what we see through our program and what, to Kia's point, educational and economic opportunities allows them to be is um, to actually, A, have them open up and realize that they made those choices out of unselfish reasons. I mean, the amount of times we've had kids come in, we had one student who literally was helping fund his mother's education through some of his choices that were illegal. Um, we've had others who were like, I'm trying to feed my siblings, or, you know, they're often making these decisions because they're unselfish, not actively trying to cause harm, though they do sometimes. And thirdly, because, um, you know, they are changeable and they want to change. And so I think UBI could uh, potentially help um, mitigate some of that lack of access and really hard wall that kids have to break through to even get to healing and um, then to thriving. I love that point. And I think all of you kind of made that global point that you might as well ask somebody to just like fly to the moon if they're hungry or they're unsheltered um, or, or don't have some of this basic stability. So those are all really good ideas and, and certainly hopeful, important ones. Um, so as we're, we're kind of nearing the end, we've had a couple of really good questions in the chat. We've touched on some of them. One of them was a very practical question. Um, Kia and Lauren, it's probably more for you. When you're preparing these lawmakers to greet someone like Rachel or Tiffany, is there a, a toolkit? Is there a set of talking points? You talked a little bit, Kia, about making sure that, that adults understand triggers as well. How do you begin to prepare them? Um, I think it's just about conversation. And what we've also learned is to let the kids kind of help drive that process for us as well. You know, we are very youth driven um, and we take a lot of our cues from them. And when we are speaking with adults, um, and preparing them to even receive our kids. It really is about an understanding of all the systemic things that come into play so that it's not so targeted and focused on the student's behavior. And so I think our job is just to educate about where the gaps in the system are, um, obviously about you know a lot of the things that are impacting our youth and our communities and making sure that they have a well-rounded awareness of where these kids are coming from so that they can appreciate and understand once they are presented with our kids. Great. Lauren, would you add anything to that? I just wanted to acknowledge we had a great peer at Foster Success, Monica, who, who did to the whole talking point question, I think a very practical thing that she said. And um, yeah, I'll kick it back to Kia if you want to clarify or add more here, but it was something to the effect of you can ask um, sort of questions about what the youth want to see change in response to their experience. Um, but just a very clear statement of like, we are not here to dig into individual's trauma or, or hard experiences. Um, yeah, and Kia, I don't know if you would clarify anything there. I think it just goes back to what we were talking about before, just making sure that that, safe, that space is safe for them. And again, that's, you know, we put a lot of onus on ourselves to make sure that the kids are prepared, you know, for those outliers sometimes um, that may come in, how do, do we teach them to pivot the conversation to respectfully decline to answer certain questions? And so I think it's it's twofold. It's us preparing our students to be able to respond to those situations um, and for the adults to understand you know, the limitations as well. That That's a really important line, I think, between storytelling being incredibly powerful and important and making sure you're not fetishizing an idea or looking for that story that gives you, you know, as, as the person in power, some sort of interesting illustration. Um, we had a really important question come in the chat or kind of a remark, and I wanted Jesse to know that we see it. And that is, we are all women on this panel, um, and that is not lost on me. And this is the first of, we hope, several conversations with Kia and Lauren and other folks 
at voices related to this youth America idea. Um, so we do want to talk to uh, boys and men about uh, those who identify as boys and men, what it's like to, to engage in, in these systems and youth policy. Um, Jesse points out really importantly that the LGBTQ community uh, has some specific issues and questions and, and opportunities and challenges when it comes to youth advocacy. Uh, they're really important protections. We have some friends here in Indianapolis at places like Trinity Haven and, and the ACLU who could help us have that conversation. So we do hope that this is the first of many and, and that we will have conversations also about very specific issue areas and, and systems involvement like DCS, uh, we have some foster youth I know at the Yes Fellows and at Voices who have some stories to share and some ideas to share. And speaking of involved youth, uh, uh, Ava, I did not uh, forget about you on there. We have someone from Chicago who's really interested in systemic change and climate change. And she asked uh, how she might be able to connect with some resources and some people. So Ava and anyone in the chat, I am at martin, M-A-R-T-I-N, at newamerica.org. Uh, reach out to me. We want to make sure we get you connected to folks uh, and, and get you connected to some advocacy opportunities. And we are um, coming up here at the end, and I want all of you on the panel to know that you're getting major kudos and snaps um, for sharing your journeys, especially Tiffany and Rachel, uh, and also for sharing the unique story about building this program. Uh, I am personally just incredibly appreciative that you've let New America Indianapolis and me just as Molly uh, into this process a little bit. It's been a real pleasure. In closing here with our last three minutes, I'm gonna do a quick round robin. Uh, I want you to tell me what you hope someone else will build after today's program. What do you hope somebody leaves this program and does that's new or different? So we'll quickly go around. Rachel, I'll start with you. I would say to create change uh, through different mediums. So whether it's written advocacy, like I first started doing, or speaking out to people, maybe planning an event or talking to your community first, raising awareness through an event like a 5K run dedicated to whatever you care about. Just trying to do advocacy through different ways. I love that. Tiffany? I hope that after listening to all of us that people are encouraged to be vulnerable and to speak out if they see something to talk. Because I feel like the first step towards advocacy is to admit that there's problems and to actually like talk about it. Lauren. Um, I hope I'm not, I'm not stealing any of your thunder, Kia, because this is something we talk about a lot and I know we are both uh, passionate about, but um, just the idea that we, like Kia and I are very aware that we are not the only ones trying to do this. And um, there are so many organizations, especially in Indy and across Indiana that have committed to including youth voice. And so the more intentional uh, we as adult facilitators can be in connecting the collective power of youth, um, the better off we'll be. And Kia with the last word. I just want people to recognize how incredibly important young people are in the process of equity and inclusion and shifting the power. I want people to create spaces of leadership for young people within organizations, learn from them, be guided by them and trust them. Fantastic. Well, I, I could not wrap it up better myself. I want to really, really thank Rachel Lobby, Tiffany Young, Kia Wright, and Lauren Hall for joining us today and being part of this special Inside Out in the Youth America series, looking at youth-led policy, how you build a program, and why it matters. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. If you've registered for the event, you'll receive a copy of the video and information on how to catch up about voices and uh, information about how to read Tiffany and Rachel's work. Again, it's been a real pleasure having you on Inside Out. Thank you on behalf of New America Indianapolis and our community partners. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe, stay warm.